Hello, everyone. Uh, in just a moment, I am going to jump into my usual spiel that I do to welcome us to the ABCs of Canadian whiskey. Uh, but before that, we all discussed this kind of backstage before we came on, and we just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge that there's a lot going on in the world right now, and it can be really overwhelming and stressful. Um, and it's it can be difficult to continue to dedicate time and energy to you know our educational pursuits and, and things that are may seem extracurricular. And so we really do appreciate you being here today and you carving out this time and energy to spend with all of us, primarily Dave and Gina, because they're the ones who have the smart things to say. Um, and before we get into all of the educational and fun parts, we just wanted to say that our hearts and minds are with the people of Ukraine and with Ukrainian folks who reside in Canada and Ukrainian Americans. Um, and I'm going to move on to educational things before I get misty eyed here on this television. So with that, I am Brittany Leach Johnson, uh, and I want to welcome you to our final class. I know it's sad, but just for now, of the ABCs of Canadian whiskey. Um, our educators today, as always for this program, are Gina Fawcett, the Trade and Education Brand Manager for Corby Canadian Whiskies, and Dave Mitten, the Global Brand Ambassador for Corby Canadian Whiskies. Um, I told you all last week we were going to be doing some myth busters this week. Uh, so the Canadian whiskey category is well known for two distinct styles, uh, blended and rye whiskey, but there are misconceptions around what these styles are or what they should be. Uh, so today, Gina and Dave are going to address those misconceptions and compare Canadian styles to other styles in blended and rye whiskey subcategories. As you can see, uh, as every week, we have a lot to cover. So make sure you ask a million questions if you got them. But first, I got some stuff I'd like for you to do. Like us on Facebook, the like button. You can It can be a thumbs up. It can be a heart. Use that button. It's good for you. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, youtube.com slash pdxcw. Follow us on Instagram. We're on Instagram at Camp Runamuck. We're also on Instagram at pdxcw. And one more reminder, comment below. Give us your questions. We'll do our best to get to all of them during the stream. But if there are any we can't get to, I'll send those over to Dave and Gina afterwards. So that way they can see if they can do some sleuthing and bust some more myths based on your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and Gina themselves. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so today, uh, it, it is our last live session with you all. We have had a wonderful time. Uh, we're going to keep having a wonderful time today. Finishing out with both, both blended whiskey and then rye whiskey. So first, we're going to dive into blended whiskey. Now, you know, most people, uh, when referring to blended whiskey and really talking about it in an educational sense, we talk about it as, you know, a culmination of science and art. Both of these things really playing a big role in creating a blend. So first, let's look at this as an art. We have our blender's palette, our artist's palette here. And we're going to look at each whiskey that is created as a different pigment of color on the palette. So kind of think of it in that way. How are we creating these different pigments that are going to come together to create this masterpiece? Okay, so some of this is going to be review. Actually, all of this will be review from the past three weeks. How can we create different flavors, our different pigments uh, on our palate. First up, let's look at grain. So remember, Canadian whiskey, primarily speaking, uh, throughout Canada is produced at 100% grain builds. So 100% corn giving us those sweet, creamy notes. Wheat is going to give us those bready, toasty notes, remember? Uh, big, bold, spicy rye. Nuttiness from barley. Hiram Walker is also producing malted rye and malted barley. And of course, there's other cereal grains that whiskey can be produced from creating different flavors. Now we can also manipulate these pigments or whiskeys 
Uh, in fermentation. And we covered this in week two. And for our certification students, uh, Amy Levesque, our distiller, went into this in depth on time of fermentation. You know, when is fermentation really getting started? How much yeast is going in at certain times of fermentation, the temperature of fermentation, and of course, the type of yeast being used, which is all going to produce different flavor compounds at the end of the day. We can also look at distillation styles. Now we're manipulating these pigments even more. Here's three uh, very common styles of distillation throughout Canada. This is not an exhaustive list, but single column distillation is going to give us, you know, a fuller bodied whiskey retaining grain and yeast characters. Taking it through a column still a second time is going to strip out that grain, strip out that yeast character, and give us a very light style whiskey. Uh, and then going through a pot still, we can even concentrate up the grain, the fruity notes, the floral notes, whatever notes the distiller really wants to focus on and concentrate up and make more accurate cut points through a pot distillation. Of course, there's other types of stills. Like I said, there's combo stills. There's all kinds of things going on in distillation in Canada, but these are really your three most common types of distillation. Then we can create these pigments, um, manipulate those flavors even more in each whiskey through maturation. Of course, the ABV it's going uh, into barrel at is going to really, you know, determine how the chemical reactions through time of ethanol uh, and oxygen, et cetera, the wood interactions are going to happen. The type of wood we're using, remember in Canada, uh, we can use any type of wood. So that means a lot of different flavors can come to life through maturation, depending on the type of wood. Of course, the time it's going to spend in barrel, how much extract are we getting from the wood? How much sulfur is the la layer of char or carbon removing, uh, or those harsh notes removing from the whiskey? Finishing barrels, are we finishing in, an, in a barrel that's been previously used? Are those contents coming into our whiskey? And the terroir, the environment of our warehouses that our whiskey is aging in. You know, is it, a, is it high humidity? Are we gaining alcohol content? Is it a, you know, a temperature fluctuation? You know, drastic temperature fluctuations like in Windsor, Ontario, producing more ethyl acetate? in our whiskey, more green apple notes, you know, that terroir is really going to affect the flavor or the pigment at the end of the day. And then finally, in bottling, you know, what strength is it bottled at? Are we doing an, an ABV that's going to bring out more wood and grain character? Uh, or an ABV that'll be a little bit more subtle, giving us more fruity notes coming to, coming to the surface or floral notes coming to the surface. And filtration as well. Um, I'm not really going to dive deep into filtration today. For our 100 certification students tomorrow with Dr. Don, uh, they have a workshop called In the Lab, and Don is going to go through filtration uh, in depth tomorrow. Okay, so now... Let's dive into a blend. From an artist's point of view, we have Mr. Bob Ross here. Um, he's going to be our artist, creating our masterpiece here. And the blend that he is going to create for us is illustrated here. Size of barrel in this illustration is indicating the quantity of that whiskey in this blend. Now, this is a blend that we bottle. You can see that primarily uh, it's a corn whiskey that is double column distilled, so a very light style of corn, but aged in brand new American oak barrels. Really going to accentuate those that vanilla, caramel, a little bit of coconut coming out there. And then the secondary whiskey here, as far as quantity goes in this blend, is a big, bold rye. It's a full-bodied rye that's been single column distilled, so bringing forth those spicy notes of the rye grain. Uh, aged in once used bourbon cask, and as we know from, from last week, that's going to give us some dried fruit notes, some fruity notes, um, a little bit of winey 
grapefruit notes. Now we go up to wheat. We have two different wheat whiskeys in this uh, blend. So now you really see the layers starting to come into play here. Layers upon layers of flavor. We have a single column distilled rye and a pot distilled rye. So these are both going to be full bodied whiskeys. Um, the single column and pot, pot distilled are both in brand new American oak. So both bringing out the vanilla caramel, both bringing out those bready notes, that pot distilled is going to concentrate up the bready notes a little bit more. And then we have another rye whiskey that is pot distilled in brand new American oak. This is a big, bold, full bodied rye again, uh, dialing up that spice, dialing up the fruity notes of the rye and the floral notes. And then we also have two barley whiskeys in here. A single column again in once used bourbon cast, those dried fruit notes uh, working with the nuttiness of the barley and then the pot distilled rye in new American oak. That's a lot to get through for one whiskey. So you can see in this whiskey, all the layers that are coming to life. And as you sip on it, when we, when we do a tasting later, you're gonna see that uh, with Dave. This whiskey is, Guterham and Warts. It's a four grain whiskey, um, but lots of distillation styles, barrels, as you can see. Uh, so just a lot going on here. And you can see really how, you know, the art of this is really important. But on the other side of it, so is the science. So let's take a look uh, and meet our master blender. Now for our certification students, uh, they were lucky enough last week to have a session with Dr. Don. Dr. Don Livermore is the master blender at Hiram Walker and Sons Distillery. He is a scientist. He is a microbiologist. He has been at the distillery for 26 years. Uh, it's his 10th year as a master blender, award-winning master blender. But he really comes to the process, you know, he does look at the art and how he's going to build flavors, but he comes to the process as a scientist and as a microbiologist. He has a PhD in brewing and distilling, uh, and he's created a lot of great award-winning whiskeys uh, through his ways of being a master blender and blending whiskeys. So he was kind enough uh, to put together a little video for us all, introducing himself to those of you um, who haven't met him yet, virtually or in person. Uh, but he's introducing himself. He's also showing you the flavor wheel that he's created specifically from a blender's point of view. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Dr. Don Livermore, Master Blender for the Hiram Walker Distillery. I'll often get asked the question, what makes a Master Blender? How do you become a Master Blender? You have to understand where Canadian whiskey has come from and the methodologies previous Master Blenders have put into place to bring it all together and why we do the things we do today. It's not about years of service. It's not about being trained by the best master blender in the world. And it's not about going to school. The most important thing for a master blender is listening to the customer and consumer. It's not about making whiskey for me. It's about making whiskey for you. And the tool that we use is the Canadian Whiskey Flavor Wheel which I developed in 2017 in coordination with the LCBO. For my mindset as a blender, I'm thinking about three things. It's either the grain, the fermentation, or the barrel. The second ring of that whiskey flavor wheel are the things that I can manipulate. I can change the fermentation parameters in the environment for the yeast, like pH or nutrients. I can change the grains around, corn, wheat, rye, or barley. If I wanna dial up the spiciness, I increase the rye in our blend. We can change the barrel. I can change the way it's burned. It could give different flavor profiles. I can change the type of barrel that we use. The third ring of the flavor wheel are the things that you care about. Those are the flavor descriptors. Banana, pineapple, caramel, toffee. The things I think about is the outside ring of that flavor wheel. Those are the molecular compounds that I measure to bring in the final whiskey. 
I hope you have a new appreciation for what it's like to be a master blender in the Canadian whiskey category. The flavor wheel is like an artist's palette. You try to marry all those components together and have an understanding of what choices you are making today can affect 20 years later. It's about leaving your legacy behind. I want to thank you for supporting our brands all the way from Canada. Cheers, eh? Okay, so that was Dr. Don and his flavor wheel. And here we are uh, with the flavor wheel. Now, if you don't have a hard copy in front of you, um, there is a little QR code at the top there. Feel free to uh, take a little shot of that. Download it for digital, having a digital copy. There's also uh, a website at the bottom there you could put in. But here is our flavor wheel. So now what this is going to allow Dr. Don to do is, you know, he's looking at creating a blend from the center of the wheel. This is where the main components of flavor come from, from his point of view, is the grain, the yeast, and the wood. He's able to take samples into the lab, measure their molecular structure, and create a bar graph on top of this flavor wheel. So as we look at Guterham and Warts, on top of this flavor wheel, it lays out really the, the molecular structure and the flavor compounds that are coming to life as he's blending these whiskeys together. Now you can see this is a polar histogram. And if you're uh, one of our students, tomorrow you will see many of these, um, which is really awesome to see how he lays out each whiskey. But you'll see in Guterham and Warts here on the right hand side, primarily that new American oak for maturation. And a lot of those whiskeys were in new American oak. A little bit of bourbon cask, right? That single column distilled rye, uh, that single column distilled barley, both in bourbon casks there. And you'll see the stills being used and the amount that goes around the outside of the circle there. Um, primarily that corn whiskey that was double column distilled. A decent amount of column distilled whiskey as well. Uh, we had that rye and then we had a wheat and barley single column distilled and a little bit of pot distilled uh, barley, wheat and rye in there as well. Now, let's go inside the circle and see what's really standing out. The biggest one is that dark blue over casks, right? And when we look at this new American oak, it's really shining through here. And, and also when we look at the primary whiskey in this blend, that light style corn whiskey, that makes sense. It's really letting these casks and, and their influence on the whiskey shine through. You'll see the green there is the finishing barrels. Now, none of these whiskeys are secondarily uh, matured in another barrel. But the fact that some of them are matured in once used bourbon casks, there, were, there was bourbon in those casks before. So some of that bourbon is coming into the whiskey that's being matured, just like it would in a finishing cask, right? Uh, we're not finishing it. It wasn't matured first in something else. It's only being, those whiskeys are only being matured in those bourbon casks, but it's, it's being measured in the lab as a finishing barrel. So you are gonna see some of that there. The two primary grains standing out are corn and rye. That really makes sense for the content of this whiskey, right? Primarily corn, the rye is a bigger, bolder uh, flavor, so that's gonna stand out as well. Some of that floral fruity notes, because those pot distilled whiskeys, they, they're, they're big. They're big, bold flavoring whiskeys. So the, the fruity and floral notes that are concentrated up along with the grain, that's really going to stand out there as well. So just a different way to really look at this and the way Dr. Don looks at uh, blends as he takes them into the lab with samples. Okay, so Bob is back. We're going to look at a different blend just to give you another perspective and kind of, you know, shake it up a bit here. Not quite as many layers uh, or quite as many whiskeys, I should say, but still a very layered blend. So this is a rye, a uh, triple barrel rye from J.P. Weiser's. This is the American triple barrel rye. Um, it has three whiskeys in it. So three grains, 
three different distillation styles and three different wood uh, barrels, I should say. That's also a lot of flavors. So this is primarily a single column distilled rye whiskey, big full bodied spice. Once used bourbon cask again, dried fruit notes coming in. Then we have that lighter style corn. That's really gonna act as the glue holding, holding these big bold flavors together so that they don't compete against each other in this blend. Uh, that corn here is, is aged in multiple use Canadian casks, meaning it's really letting what happens in the warehouse, uh, that ethyl acetate development, that green apple note that we talked about in previous weeks, letting that shine through and let this be kind of take a back seat and just kind of let everything meld together a little bit easier. And then we have a little bit of uh, pot distilled wheat here. Um, this is going to be a very concentrated wheat in those pot stills with the cut points, brand new American oak. So we're going to get, you know, those vanilla, caramel, a little bit of coconut notes. So lots of layers again, less whiskeys in this one, but still very layered and complex. Back to our flavor wheel. Let's look at it as a polar histogram. Again, that QR code is up there in the corner if you need it. Um, bourbon cask, really, you know, that's our primary cask. That's, it's primarily that rye whiskey aged in those bourbon casks. So that makes sense, right? Uh, so finishing barrels is really the standout here, uh, along with the rye grain and a little bit of that corn um, standing out. Those are our primary grains. The bourbon cask are our primary barrels, so it really makes sense that those flavor notes and their molecular structures really are shining through here. And then that floral fruity note also coming through uh, from the rye grain has some nice floral notes as well, but also that, that little bit of wheat being concentrated and cutting, uh, concentrating that floral fruity and of course the bready notes um, there. So. You can see this one on the polar histogram here. Again, mostly that single column distilled rye, as you can see on the outside of the circle, single column distillation. So just another way to look at it, but here is, you know, looking at it from the art and then looking at it from the science as well. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to Dave to take you through both of these beautiful whiskeys as blends uh, and taste through them. I don't want to hold up the tasting part because I know that's I mean, that's the thing I look forward to in every <laughs> educational situation. But we did have two questions that I think we could probably address now uh, okay. that will help us as we get a little further into this. Sure. Um, so Darian asked this question when the first polar histogram was up for Gutterham and Wurtz. Um, is each flavor compound, does it correspond to how potent that flavor note is for the average palate? Or is it a detection of prevalence, which uh, in last week's uh, session, she noticed doesn't necessarily correspond to flavor perception for all palates? So everybody's flavor perception, you know, we're human and we're all made up of different cells. So we all have you know, we all taste different things, smell different things, even touch, you know, if everything feels maybe similar in a way that we would might describe it similarly, but it's, it's possibly very different. Um, so really this is, you know, on the polar histogram, this is the way the lab equipment, which Dawn is going to go through, believe me, in depth tomorrow, <laughs> you'll get a much clearer understanding uh, of this, but this is literally the, the uh, measurement of those molecular compounds and the quantity of how they're measuring out specifically. You got it, Darian. Science, baby. Science. Uh, you know, <laughs> Darian is a, a person who's very passionate about the, the science -y part. So I'm sure that that was a welcome answer. And then the other question that came in, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, does Hiram Walker barrel any corn distillate that isn't double column distilled? Ooh, I don't know of a bottling that we have that has a single column corn. Uh, that we're certainly doing some mash bills, uh, like 
Amy touched on, if you were, you know, one of our students part of that workshop in week two, there's certainly some corn forward mash bills being produced. Uh, but I don't know of any of our Canadian blends that are single column distilled corn. I'm going to refer to Dave in case he's seen something in the warehouse when that I haven't. There is not to my knowledge. Um, it has been spoken about in the past many times. Um, even one of, I don't want to, I'm not name dropping, but for all the Americans watching, one of your greatest cocktail writer historians has been to the distillery with us and he's brought up how he thought it would be brilliant if we had a s version like that. I've, we've often talked about column and pot distilling it, um, played around. I'd love to see a cast strength corn whiskey come out because I think Canadian corn whiskey is one of the most underrated North American whiskeys. But again, we've not done anything to showcase it as of yet is all I will say. I will also say, let's ask Dr. Don tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, Get him on the hey, spot. Yeah. That might be something. David and I haven't been to the distillery much in the last two years. So yeah. that might be something uh, we don't know about. Well, and for our certification students, if uh, they're, they currently are not barreling any single column corn, you can use Dr. Don's own words against him. In the video, he says he makes whiskey for us, not for him. I think we, we browbeat him into getting some in a barrel. All right, Dave, I, I had to interrupt you. Moberly's in Seattle. I haven't had anyone to bully today. <laughs> so uh, this probably won't be the last time, but please let me get out of the way so we can get to the good part, which is the whiskey tasting. Yeah. I, I love it. And it's a great segue anyway. Gina and Britt always help me out with everything they do. So to go to that, Dr. Dawn, this is an honest to goodness thing. I've watched over eight years of working with him. He does want to make what you want. I've never encountered anyone at Corby, Pernod Ricard, Hiram Walker that like, uh, he really listens and some blends and expressions he's created over the last few years have come from outpour over social media. Um, for instance, we're going to get into one right now. Uh, the JP Weiser's triple barrel rye. Now, I don't want to get too confusing. This is the JP Weiser's triple barrel rye, which is, this is only available in the US. Now we have a Canadian expression, which I'll talk about later on today uh, and why that is and what the differences are. But this in particular expression, Gene and I often say, Dr. It's a Canadian whiskey made with the American palate in mind. And Dr. Don did create this for the American market. Um, now, as we've learned the last four weeks, uh, Traditional Canadian whiskeys, generally that soft double column distilled corn with a little pinch of rye added into it, aged in ex Canadian whiskey casks, minimum three years. That is your traditional style of Canadian whiskey. This JP Weiser's triple barrel rye, US expression, is certainly not that. This is made in a very Canadian way where all of the grains, as Gina just went through, are all fermented, distilled separately in different ways, aged separately in different types of casks and Dr. Dawn blends everything together at the end to make this lovely expression. Now, the majority of this whiskey is a once column distilled rye uh, aged in ex bourbon casks. And then it is a, uh, it's about 60%. And then 37% of that soft double column distilled corn aged in used Canadian whiskey casks which leaves us, if my math is correct, 3% of that column and pot distilled wheat aged in the new American oak. Now, you first look at this, I should say it's also bottled at 45 ABV or 90 proof. It's a deep amber color, as you could probably see, or if it's in front of you as our students would have. Prominent rye bread, lots of banana, some sour cherry, uh, certainly the baking spices from the rye, a little bit of ginger. And then I certainly get this deep mature oak, vanilla toffee as well. Now, it is full and round. I think so, at least. And you get that rye spice. It's rye through and through. Uh, it's got an elegant strength to it, delicate floral notes. Um, this is a beautiful whiskey. 
high and dry. You can make a rye and ginger. This is great for that, but also it's got enough rye spice and complexity to it that it does work great in cocktails. I mean, your classics from Diamondbacks, Vucades, Boulevardiers, works beautifully. Uh, easy to sip on as well. One of my favorites, and we'll go more into that later on. Now, next up, unless we have any questions right now on that, or maybe at the no, end. Everyone's just admiring the whiskey. And then here, oh, I can't turn right. The Gooder Ham and Warts, one of my faves. Now, Gina has been, and Dawn last week, we've certainly been talking about the history of Gooder Ham and Warts over since the mid 1800s here in uh, downtown Toronto, Canada. And now, happy to say, we are selling Gooder Ham and Warts south of the border in the US. So two markets it's sold in, Canada and the United States for the moment. Founded by William Gooderham and James Warts in the 1830s, as Gina's explained to you, and we've talked about how they were uh, very prominent in the whiskey making world in Canada. They helped build the city of Toronto. Um, and at one point in the year 1877, they were the largest distillery in the world. Now, I always say that Gooderham and Warts, it's a great, expression of whiskey where marketing and whiskey making meets. We brought this brand back a few years ago and the marketing team thought it was great. Dr. Don put some blends together and Don thought if we're going to give homage to Gooderham and Wurtz who were grain millers before they became whiskey makers, that he would want to create a four grain whiskey. And certainly in Canada, five, six years ago, that was not a norm. And I'd even dare to say in the US, it was not a norm to have four grain whiskeys. Um, I know things have been changing the last few years and we're seeing beautiful expressions come out from all distilleries across both countries. Uh, but this is probably our most complex blend. As Gina mentioned, it's uh, four grains, seven distillates, two types of casks, bottled at 44.4 ABV. And that's Dr. Don's little humor of aging or sorry of uh the strength of a four grain whiskey now as gina mentioned you've got your soft double column distilled corn in brand new american oak you have two wheat distillates you've got a once column and a column and pot distilled you've and the, the once column is in uh the ex bourbon cast the column and pot distilled is in the new american oak you have the barley and it's the same thing once column and then once column and pot distilled, and then you've got the once column rye, age and ex bourbon casks, and you've got the once column and pot distilled rye, age in the brand new American oak. Sorry, that's a big mouthful. It's even for me to remember it all. I was waiting. I was looking at Gina. I'm like, am I wrong? It's a long list. It's a long like, list. <laughs> but you've got you have corn, rye, wheat, and barley basically in two types of casks. Now, as we mentioned earlier. Not every, as Gina said, we're built up of different cells. We're going to smell different things. We're going to taste different things. So when I walk through a whiskey, it's basically what I'm getting. And I love doing this live in front of people because I like to hear back what people also get. Now, this is a beautiful golden amber. And on the nose, I think this is one of the whiskeys when we nose it and sip it, we kind of walk through those grains. I really get a lot of that like baked, fresh baked bread from the wheat. A little bit of nuttiness, certainly some mature oak, that little dustiness. First sip, obviously this is a big full bodied whiskey. Perfect to sip on its own, but also works really great in cocktails. Um, you get that soft, sweet, rich, uh, full mouthfeel from the corn. Uh, you get the warming spice from the rye. Uh, it's absolutely lovely. You kind of get baked apples, a little bit of honey off this. And where we found a lot of people like to sip this on its own, especially bourbon drinkers. We've noticed at whiskey shows across Canada and before the pandemic, when we were launching it in the U.S., at whiskey shows, bourbon drinkers seem to gravitate towards this whiskey, which makes sense. It's a majority of that corn, almost the same amount of rye, and then you get some complexity from the wheat and barley. Now, we've also, happy to say, noticed bartenders using this a lot and cocktail lists as well. Um, 
they're doing old fashions and Manhattans, your classic cocktails with it. But we're seeing a, a little cheeky side where people are creating um, the Toronto cocktail, which if you're not familiar with that from the 1950s, it is, it's got a long history to it, uh, but it is a bitter ver variation of a Manhattan, essentially. It's majority of whiskey, some uh, sugar, and then Fernet Branca uh, to add that nice bitterness, richness to it. Uh, also, this is comes from the marketing side of my brain, not that I have one of those, but uh, where the first sour recorded on paper was in a Toronto saloon almost a hundred years after this distillery opened up. I'd like to think that that sour would have been made with a spirit that came out of downtown Toronto's local distillery, Gooderham and Warts. So Gina and I often on our uh, cocktails uh, adventures will do whiskey sours with the Gooderham and Warts, which works beautifully. How's that, Gina Fawcett? I love Professor? it. Professor? I love it. We I have think, oh, one we have question. question. Uh, we have, uh, it's mostly people saying that they love it once again. So surprised. Um, but we did have one question from Josh Seberg. Um, said, you mentioned dustiness, which is something I see a lot in younger whiskeys, but what does that dustiness flavor come from in terms of the flavor wheel? That's a personal thing. And, and I mean, maybe Dawn would slap me on the hand for saying dusty, but when we talk about mature oak, kind of like the autumn floors of mature oak, there's, how do I say this? I'm probably going to go off in a ramble. Gina, professor, shut me up. Um, as we've been going on, there's 1.6 million barrels of whiskey at Pinewalker. Uh, a lot of those barrels have been reused. I've been doing this long enough now that if you lined up the nine whiskeys in this kit right now and said, Dave, I want you to nose them all, blindfolded, taste them, tell me what they are, I'd like to think I would do it. Um, I haven't tried that in a while. I should. But there's this, I always get this one flavor where I, I can tell it's that Hiram Walker corn whiskey. And when I sip it and nose it, and it's kind of that, it is the mature oak. I say dusty. Gina's probably angry at me right now. Dusty might be the wrong word, but it's just kind of that maturity. It's been in the barrel for a long time. It's got that nose I, and feel to it. I'll say like, and this is where perception, right? Our human perception. And we've been saying like, you might taste something differently. Um, and Don's going to go through like, how he creates tasting notes. Um, and, and we should ask him tomorrow as well how he can molecularly measure dustiness or what we're referring to here. But Dave and I have very different perceptions of that note. Uh, for me, anytime I taste a whiskey with wheat in it, I describe it as a little bit of dustiness. Um, so you know, for Dave, it's that, you know, that light style corn coming out. And for me, it's actually a little bit of wheat. And both of these whiskeys have wheat in it. And I definitely pick that up on, on both of these in a good way, you know. So again, just different perceptions uh, when we're tasting things, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, but tomorrow for our students, uh, let's again ask Don because he can measure this stuff. What can't he do? Um, also, <laughs> Dave, since Gina's the professor, I think your final exam should be tasting all nine marks in the kit and identifying them. I'm just putting it out there. It's just an idea. You know? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, Gina and I, for working side by side, have not seen each other in just over two years and we're planning a reu reunion so soon. Maybe we'll do that live. Maybe we'll drink nine mm -hmm. different whiskeys live. That would be so great. I love that plan. I really hope that this, let us know if you need to use the, our Facebook. I'd be happy. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to get out of the way. So, because I know we've got more whiskey information and we've got more tasting. So, continue. okay. So, rye whiskey, here we go. 
Uh, we're going to dive into rye today. Of course, Canadian rye, that's what we're talking about, right? But we're also going to compare Canadian rye to American rye because like we said at the very beginning of this course, Dave and I are really always trying to, you know, uh, demystify, debunk misconceptions uh, in the category. And this is a big area of misconceptions. So first, let's review Canadian rye. What does that mean? This is review. From week one in history, remember in the 1800s, we had the English commercially distilling wheat, right? That lighter style grain uh, producing whiskey in Canada. And then the Germans migrated into Canada. The English started putting a little, little, little tiny bit of rye, like 5 to 10% of rye into those wheat whiskeys. You either had a whiskey or a rye. And so as an ode to that history, today there is no minimum amount of rye required to be in a bottle of Canadian rye. Also, the name of the one category in Canada of Canadian whiskey is Canadian whiskey, Canadian rye whiskey, or rye whiskey, showing you how important that itty bitty amount of rye going into a traditional style really became to the category and that traditional style of Canadian whiskey. Now, when we look at different styles, there are many different styles of Canadian whiskey, but when we're looking at Canadian rye specifically, there's many different styles across the country. We have that traditional style like we just talked about, which is primarily corn with a little bit of, of rye, tends to be. Uh, we have a rye blend. We just tasted triple barrel rye. Uh, so this, this blend specifically is primarily rye and, and a few other whiskeys in that blend, right? And then we can also do like a big, bold, 100% one distillate in a bottle. Uh, which would be like Lot 40, and we're going to taste that with Dave a little bit later. So lots of different styles and things in between those styles as well throughout Canada. Okay, so now let's really compare Canadian rye to American rye. Looking at what I'm going to call mash bills hesitantly, um, you know, we're not making mash bills primarily in Canada. Primarily, we're producing 100% grain builds. Okay. So hundred percent rye, hundred percent corn, and they are blended at the end of the process. In the U S by regulation, a rye whiskey has to be a minimum of 51% rye. Now, usually this is going to have some barley in it, uh, some other grains typically, but those grains are blended together during the mash toward the beginning of the process, right? to make our mash bill go through the entire process as one mash bill to make one whiskey there. When we look at fermentation, if we're doing rye at 100% grain build or any of our whiskeys in Canada besides a malted um, grain, we're really needing to use exogenous enzymes, meaning enzymes that are cultivated in a lab outside of a malted grain, like a malted barley, uh, we really need to use those to help the fermentation process get started. And they really are more efficient. They're faster. They give us higher yields. Uh, it, it really doesn't make sense not to use them, to be quite honest. Now, in American whiskeys, typically what you'll see uh, are some endogenous enzymes coming from, if there's a malted barley, typically in a mash bill, but also most American ryes are also using some exogenous enzymes. You know, this is a personal perspective, um, but I really haven't seen a rye with less than 15% malted barley in it, uh, not using exogenous enzymes as well to help that process along. It would just take too long. Different distillation styles. Now, you know, the type of still you use in either country uh, is not regulated. Uh, most common distillation styles, of course, in Canada are that double or 
even triple column distilled uh, whiskeys. So really stripping out grain and yeast character, producing that lighter style. A single column distilled fuller bodied whiskey or a column and then going into a pot to concentrate up specific flavor notes. In the U.S., it is regulated that out of distillation, you cannot exceed 160 proof or 80% ABV. Most of your big house American ryes, uh, like I said, this isn't regulated, but most of them are going to use a column still, a single column still, just like the rye uh, in J.P. Weiser's triple barrel rye, that same distillation style. Then a lot of them in the U.S. are going to go through a doubler. Now, what a doubler is, is kind of like a, a quick pot distillation, really, you know, depending on the size of your stills and equipment. But you could, you could do a fairly large batch through a doubler in like 30 minutes. And what it's going to do is up your ABV and possibly increase copper contact on the liquid if you need a little bit more copper contact. Um, so a lot of American ryes will see, see the whiskeys going through a doubler as well. Usually you're not going to see any cut points on this whiskey. Uh, same as in Canada, uh, a lot of the whiskeys going through a single column distillation, uh, we're not going to make cut points on. And then maturation. So by regulation in Canada, minimum three years in small wood under 700 liter barrels, right? But not specific to any type of wood. In the U.S. for a rye whiskey, there is no minimum age requirement. Now, it must be aged in new charred oak, but there's no minimum aging requirement. So technically, you could age it for five minutes. Um, seems a little silly. You wouldn't get, you know, much wood influence, additive or subtractive, uh, but you could do it. Now, if it's a straight rye whiskey in the U.S., then you do have a minimum age requirement of two years. Uh, so there are some aging requirement differences here between uh, Canada and the U.S. And then finally, when we look at blending, you know, specifically to rye whiskey, it, it's a whole huge topic in and of itself. And we, we touched on it earlier, but, you know, specific to rye whiskey, in Canada, we're going to be blending completely different whiskeys, you know, if we're at 100% grain builds, right? Uh, different ages, different barrel types, because we have, we can use any type of wood to produce a specific flavor profile. And most of the time that blending is going to happen after maturation of all of the whiskeys. Now, one thing in Canada is that most blends are single distillery blends. Because you're not going to, typically, you're not going to see a, a distillery just producing corn or just producing rye or just producing wheat. Uh, typically, they're going to want more of those pigments, right, uh, on their palate to work with at the end of the day. So then typically, you're going to see single distillery blends happening. Now, you know, when we talk about American rye and blending in the U.S., um, Producers like to use the word mingle and not blend for some reason. Um, but most are going to blend or mingle. It's the same thing. Uh, the same mash bills, you know, because they produce, typically will produce one mash bill. A few, some distilleries produce multiple mash bills. But typically you're going to see um, a mingling of the same mash bill the same barrel type, because by regulation to be a rye whiskey has to be new charred oak, right? Uh, maybe different ages or different places they sit in the warehouse or the rickhouses uh, to, to produce different flavor profiles across one brand um, or one producer. Now, we are allowed in the U.S. to blend different mash bills, so completely different whiskeys. They could come from different distilleries and different production processes, but as long as they're both, uh, you know, could be labeled by regulation a rye or a straight rye, then they can be labeled, blended together, an American rye or an American straight rye whiskey. They do not, by regulation, need to be labeled 
a blended whiskey. In Canada, we would label that a blended whiskey because they're different whiskeys, right? So just looking at these side by side and really seeing some similarities, um, but certainly some major call outs and differences in the category. Okay, so why rye? Now I'm gonna touch on this. Uh, Dr. Dawn is going into this in fine detail tomorrow as well. So just know you're going a lot deeper tomorrow on this, but I want to kind of give you an overview of why rye. What, you know, what's the hype about with rye whiskey? So this is one of Dr. Don's uh, images here and, and his charts coming up. And this is really, you know, rye is a plant. And we looked at this, you know, in terms of wood as well during the maturation week, right? Made up of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. That's the structure of the plant, okay? Now, rye in particular has more lignin. Now, we're looking at lignin with an I-N, lignin's with an A-N. Lignin with an I-N is a bigger, much bigger compound structurally and will break down, needs to be broken down uh, to produce specific flavors. Lignins with an AN are much smaller uh, structurally. You can see though on this chart, both have more, uh, rye has more lignin uh, on, on both levels here than any other grain. And that's really the call out. That's what's giving us our spice. So here is a giant lignin molecule. It's gonna break down just like the compounds in wood from heat, from heating it up. So here we're gonna heat it up in the cooking process and the distillation process. And now we're gonna break this giant lignin down into much smaller compounds, producing different flavor notes. Wood, leather, spice, spicy sweet smoke, clove, a little bit of smoke. Um, you know, all of these notes that we know rye to be flavor wise, this is where they're coming from, the lignin, the breaking down of these giant compounds. And then the lignin can be concentrated again when we are pot distilling, more so than if we pot distilled a corn because there's more lignin there to break down, right? So we can develop more spice than we can in any other grain. Okay, back to Dr. Don's flavor wheel. And when we look at rye specifically, if you look at that third ring on the flavor wheel, the first word in every description is spicy. Spicy, 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 spicy. Rye equals spicy. And of course, other notes, but spice is really the, the, the highlight of this grain specifically. Okay. And now, for the last time in our four weeks together, I'm going to pass it off to Dave uh, to taste us through triple barrel rye one more time uh, in comparison to Lot 40. So two completely different styles. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I have to address what I talked about before with the J.P. Weiser's triple barrel rye American expression as we just went through versus the Canadian. Um, as you, you know, Don, Gene and I always tell it like it is. We're not marketers by trade. We're not sales by trade. We're educators, but we got to go into both of those worlds. So JP Weiser's Deluxe, our traditional style Canadian whiskey, which is a majority of soft corn, pinch of rye, ex Canadian casks. That works for the majority of the population in Canada. Some people will say an older generation. Some people say the younger generation certainly have more complex palates. There's all kinds of theories. But the idea behind creating the JP Wise's triple barrel rye was to make a Canadian whiskey with a higher percentage of rye than your traditional style. So in Canada, it's I believe Don does not like to talk about percentages, but you'd be three, quor three, three quarters of soft corn, and then you'd have about a quarter of uh, once column and pot distilled rye, once column distilled rye, and the third distillate being a, 
column and pot to still dry. That's the Canadian one. Not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the 60% rye, 37% corn, and 3% uh, wheat. Now, I mean, we just went over this, it, it, so I'm not going to take you through the tasty notes again, but it's that whiskey we made with the American palate in mind. It's a majority of rye with the spicy notes, the corn to add the soft sweetness and the wheat, wheat same softness, breadiness. Works great in classic cocktails. High rye and dry. Sorry, I'm stumbling my words right now. Uh, works on all occasions. Even great to sip or perfect with a beer. Now, it's a, certainly a higher percentage of rye for Canadian whiskeys. It's an unusually large amount of rye for a Canadian whiskey, but pretty standard as Gina was just talking about American rye whiskeys. That was the idea behind creating this, to try to, as I said earlier, create something for the American palate. It's been going over well. It's got some nice accolades, and we're seeing a lot of people across the U.S., I get asked a lot. I'm sure someone's going to ask if we're going to see it in Canada. Um, that's an answer I can't give right now, but you never know. We'll see how it does. Um, now, on to our 100% rye whiskey. Look at me. I still can't figure out how to work a camera. Lot 40, our 100% rye grain. As someone we used to work with used to always say, it's rye in its purest form, and I have taken that line and run with it. It is rye in its purest form. It is 100% unmalted rye, as we learned earlier in this course. It is uh, column, once column and pot distilled afterwards to concentrate up all the notes of the rye grain. And aged in brand new American oak, which I often say tames the beast, but it mellows it out as rye is a, Gina just went through a very big, spicy, bold grain. Now it's bottled at 43 percent ABV, 86 proof. It too is a deep, deep, rich amber color. Now lots, I get lots of sour rye bread on this. Almost like a, a fruit to it, like a little pear, certainly warm honey, lots of rich vanilla and lots of floral notes, lots of floral notes coming from it. And that's where we, in the pot distillation, by concentrating up a lot of these notes, we discard of the heads and the tails and just keep the hearts. And that's a lot of the rye grain and floral notes. Sipping it. It's certainly one of our bigger whiskeys. It's a lot more complex than the softer corn whiskeys, but it's got a sweet, elegant side to it. Um, I get lots of rye spice off of, off of this, obviously. Uh, Perfect in all of your classic cocktails, old fashions in Manhattan's, view cut A's. We see a lot of that where across Canada, a lot of cocktail bars uses their house pour. And we're seeing it certainly in the U.S. and overseas in a lot of cocktail lists. And there's certainly uh, lots of stirred, if not classic, inspired by classic cocktails. But with its soft, elegant side, we're seeing a lot of more tall, refreshing drinks, people mixing it with citrus and sherries and some of the hotter areas in the U.S., warmer areas, I should say, like Texas, California, Florida. We're seeing we're seeing La Forty served at poolside, which is great. You don't always think of a big rye whiskey as a summer drink, but we're seeing it, and I love it. Keeps me in business. Keeps me traveling to visit you all. Um, any thoughts on these? I have a thought. I love, especially when we have two different styles of something, we're kind of, you know, in the same realm, same category. I love kind of nosing back and forth, tasting back and forth. It really helps me, at least. Um, it, it helps my palate really find the, the standout notes of each thing. And even the finish is very different on both of these. Um, so just something for everyone to try at home. I think that's kind of a fun way to, no matter what type of whiskey you're trying, um, to really kind of find the differences between two two things. What let's do that right now, Gina Fawcett, Professor. What do you what do you off the uh, JP Weiser's triple barrel? The I triple barrel on the nose to me is much sweeter. Hundred percent. 
You know, and I think maybe part of that is the fruitiness coming off of those ex uh, bourbon casks. That really, really stands out to me. It's also, almost a richness. Yeah. And on the palate, though, to me, this finishes shorter and drier. Uh, where on the palate, Lot 40 has a longer, lingering, more caramel, vanilla finish to it. So, you know, that's for me. Um, but I think that those are really some standout uh, tasting notes for me between the two. Excellent. Well, we do have a couple of questions, some about the part of the presentation that was focused on rye and some about Lot 40 um, well, and J.P. Weiser's Triple Barrel. Um, so Brian asked, have, have they stopped selling the Triple Barrel in Canada? No, it's still on shelves in every province that I know of. God. It's just the, it's the Canadian, it's the Canadian expression. And to be honest, there is, I mean, this is the way it kind of works right now. Like some brands we have are completely the same everywhere. Like mm -hmm. Law 40, you can buy this in 20 countries right now. It's the same liquid inside. Uh, JPY is just a lock, same liquid. Uh, where we created something for the American market, that's what it was. There is a JP Weiser's 10 year old that is sold in the UK and European market. So that's a whole, wherever I land, I have to remind myself where I am and what it is. So right now the triple barrel rye Canadian expression that is available from coast to coast in Canada. And it's beautiful, just a little bit different. So but I'm not available in the US, the Canadian version, just to be no. clear for all the Americans. <laughs> for our, uh, for, since we have both Canadian and American students in this, uh, in our group of 100, there is a Canadian version of the JP Weiser's triple barrel that's sold in Canada and an American version that is sold in the US. That everyone has in their kits, that is the American version. So what you're tasting now, whether you are U.S. or Canada, you're tasting the American version, but you can buy triple barrel either or. They're just going to be slightly different. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, and I saw someone asked, is Lot 40 available in the U.S.? It is. Um, are there any um, like places you don't sell it in the U.S.? I mean, I live in Alabama, may arguably one of the worst control states no offense love being from alabama but boy getting product here is not a fun time uh are there any places where someone might not be able to find lot 40. Well, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Dave. i would just say I, I the fact that you said that Brittany, like last week when i was looking at everyone's um cocktail posts and by the way i saw them all i don't i didn't i didn't get to repost them all or which i normally like to do but i did see them read them appreciate them love them Someone, and I forget where it was, they posted the old, old Law 40 bottle with the yellow label. And that goes back a few years. Uh, same liquid, just marketing changed the label. And I thought, man, I should get to that market and help them sell some, get some <laughs> bottles through so we can get the updated label. And, and I will say, you know, once this course is complete, uh, everyone should just have their eye out. We're going to send out a... Um, list of what products are available in each state and your distributor so it's easier for you to find anything that uh, you're gravitating toward man that is so helpful uh Tanette, you will find out who won the cocktail contest i will be honest i did some scoring earlier because we all score everything um no one no one said anything about space barrels in any of their posts with me. so <laughs> well, you got a really high score for me but that's fine uh, fortunately, this is a, a committee, not not a Britney show, because uh, I didn't see any space. Um, so someone asked if you could briefly go over the differences in the Canadian and the American version of the triple barrel ride. Yeah, of course. So the Canadian version, and you know what, this is good. If we get time, I'll tell a little story of how the American came to be. So the Canadian version was it was simple as this where jp weiser's deluxe our house brand the traditional style being majority corn a little bit of rye the idea was to create a new expression that was higher in rye uh, for people with different palettes because not everybody wants a soft 
easy sifting whiskey. Sometimes people want a little more complexity. Um, especially, I've noticed it, like younger generations. I mean, you look at older generations who are raised on meat and potatoes and might not have as much of a complex palate like someone's grandfather. Look, but you then, can just say it. Us Americans are spicy. Well, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I do think of that. I think like when you go to places like certainly down in the south, and and you know just the food that's available to us now. I don't want to get too into this, but it's like people's palates are different. People like bigger beers now, hoppier beers. People like more complex whiskeys. It's just what's happening. So the idea to build the triple barrel rye expression for Canada comes into play. And nobody wanted to go too overboard because, A, we had the 100% rye whiskey, Lot 40. So JP Weiser's generally being more corn focused in all of their expressions. We kept it at about 75% soft double column distilled corn. And then it, the rest, the, the, the 25%, 24% of it is once column distilled corn and 1% is once column and pot distilled. Now, you mean rye, not corn. Yeah, rye, pardon me. Uh, now, Don, you're going to learn tomorrow. Don does not like talking about percentages because that is more of an American way of making whiskey. It's not Canadian. But just I'm explaining them now so you get the difference. Um, so that is the Canadian version. 75% corn, 25% rye. Two different types of rye. 43.4% ABV. The triple barrel rye in America. Now, depending where you are, if anyone out in the U.S. ever sees a J.P. Weiser's cream-labeled bottle that says R-Y-E on it, rye. J.P. Weiser's rye. That was something that was put out years and years ago, and I believe most of it's off shelves, but who knows? You could find it somewhere, maybe. And that was a similar expression where it was majority corn with, like, a higher amount of rye, but it really just didn't work in the American market because Americans see R-Y-E on a label and they think American rye. And this is a great example of where Don listens. It was not doing well in the U.S. You know, our sales teams, distributors came to us. The bartenders came to me. It just wasn't what people expected. So we went back to the drawing board and Don said, well, I'm going to give them what they want. I'll give them. He still had, he made it in the Canadian way where everything was fermented, distilled, aged separately. But he did that once column distilled rye, which is very American, 60% of it. 37% of that corn. And then he added in the wheat because he wanted a little more complexity, the bready notes, 3% of the wheat in there. And he bottled it at 45 ABV for that 90 proof. And that's that's what the students, that's what you're all drinking today. So where the Canadians online can have some fun that if they want to go grab a bottle or if they have some at their bar, they can taste uh, next to each other. But it is the Canadian versions only available in Canada. Hmm. Well, there you have it. And God bless Dr. Dawn. Always listening. <laughs> Always to us spicy, spicy boys down here. Uh, we did have some questions uh, related to the rye part of the presentation, though. Okay. Um, so um, one is, is the category of Canadian rye older than American rye as a category? Cool. Well, the regulations for Canada really didn't start to come into effect until after Prohibition. Um, so, you know, if, if we're looking at regulations, uh, it, it might be younger or it might be older, I'm sorry, than American rye by regulation by, you know, America is an older country and has been producing whiskey longer than Canada because it is an older country. And so, you know, when we talk about it in that sense, um, American rye as a category would be older. Okay. And it's a great question too, Sam. And I mean, you could, we could probably really geek out with Dawn on this because it even brings up things like, truth be told, during American Prohibition, you know, the Gooderman Wurst Distillery were making some American rye and bourbons. 
and that's like going to their categories of, but I mean, even those regulations back then were different. Like you, obviously you can't make a bourbon or American rye in Canada, but we were back then and bottling it and selling it to the U S uh, and Don is going into that in depth tomorrow. So you're going to see uh, some old recipes of bourbon being made at Hiram Walker before the 1960s. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. I think we take them, put them in those barrels from space, <laughs> add some single column distilled corn. Let's see, Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm sure Dr. Don is really looking forward to my input on, on his product. Um, so another question that someone asked is, uh, whiskey sold in Europe must be entirely mashed with endogenous enzymes. Does this mean that Canadian and U.S. whiskey sold in Europe also conform to that requirement? No, they do not. They, uh, you know, like, you know, class one, when we went through regulations and we said both you know, we were comparing Canada to the US, but both countries adhere to, you know, international regulations, meaning if you buy a scotch in the US, it's adhering to Scotland's regulations on scotch. The same goes in Europe. Um, there's a few exceptions to that where like, you know, uh, just off the still, and I know Don talked about this last week in his workshop that he they only distill to a, a certain ABV because of EU and uh, US regulations, but it's not regulated in Canada. So there are a few exceptions to that. But um, for the most part, countries are adhering to international regulations. And I was gonna say we could even go in deeper with Dawn because I know we have a few exceptions where it's like there are like non GMO and like when, when a country sets mm -hmm. the standards and rules, we either stop selling or we start right. making the whiskeys to their specifications. But as Gina said, we, to make life easier for everyone is a simpler way to put it, but it's to try to create everything, the exact same recipe, <laughs> same way. Like the idea is I don't want to go to Australia and buy a bottle of Law 40 and have it taste different than a bottle of Law 40 from the US. We don't want that to happen. Yeah. That's where the triple barrel rye is a very unique, uh, situation but fact of the matter is it just it's the way it played out there you have it so we have gotten to all of the questions today great uh, amazing which i feel very good about because i think tomorrow is gonna just be graph science party time central in the zoom leading <laughs> right into finals that's right I, so I hope, I hope everybody's feeling ready to have one more go with Dr. Don, talk about these space barrels. Please don't ask him about that. He's, he's going to be like, why, why do you let her work here? Uh, but, uh, we're going to talk about space barrels. We're going to talk about science. And then you all are going to be fully prepared for your final exams. Um, so with that, Dave, Gina, is there anything else you want to cover before we get into what I feel like now on our last uh, on our last class of this session is our famous sign off? Our famous sign off. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, we've had a wonderful time with all of you. Uh, thanks for tuning in. You know, we're we're so glad that we shared this with everyone uh, these Wednesday sessions because to us, it's just really important that people learn more about the category. Like we said, there's so many misconceptions out there and, and we just really want to share, share the love of Canadian whiskey. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, we were chatting about this backstage earlier. We're still blown away by the overwhelming amount of people that apply. I was concerned. I was worried there'd be, we wouldn't have a hundred people that would even apply. And it ended up being a very large number of people. So anyone watching that did not make it into the certification, thank you for applying. We're already starting to put thought into next year and how often we will do this. And this has proven to us so far uh, <laughs> to work out brilliantly. And we've loved having you. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a great way to sign off, but Thank you. Thank you. This is not the last time we're doing this. We'll be coming back really soon for our next certification. 
Thanks to everybody at Camp Runamuck and Portland Cocktail Week. Made our life much easier. <laughs> uh, well, that's what we aim to do. It doesn't always work out. I have started an entire campaign about barrels from space. So I think, eh, you know, it's uh, some good, some bad. Um, on behalf, before I go into the things that I am obligated to say before we get out of here, on behalf of Camp Runamuck, Portland Cocktail Week, Lush Life, this has been an excellent, excellent group of students. We're very excited to see y'all again tomorrow and to watch you all ace your finals, because we know that's exactly how this is going down. And Dave and Gina, we couldn't be more grateful to y'all for providing this kind of content for our platforms. It makes us look really good, because you're really good at what you do. So thank you so much. And with that, please, if you are watching this, hit that like or love button. I was informed that you all are not doing a great job with the like and love buttons. So let's hit this like, hit this love button. You, we know you love this, so let's show us digitally. Um, and you can always toss us a follow here at Camp Runamuck or over on our sister Facebook page at Portland Cocktail Week. You can also follow our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash pdxcw. And we are, we still have an Instagram. Thank God for Amanda. We still have one. Uh, you can find that at Camp Runamuck or you can follow at pdxcw. Both in my world, ideally both, you do both. Um, and it has been such a pleasure spending each Wednesday with both of you and with everybody watching. And for all of our students, we will see you tomorrow.